My hand is on the doorknob. I'm trembling violently. Oh, pull yourself together, girl. Yes. All right, then. Have another look in that full-length mirror, if you think it will give you more confidence. In a few moments, the dream of your life will be coming true. Out into the corridor, along to the head of the stairs, now for it. Waves of music. The dancing has already begun. Do the thing you fear, and fear will vanish. Do the thing you fear, and fear will vanish. Do the thing you fear, and fear will vanish. Now I'm walking down the wide sweep of the staircase, and my fear is vanishing. Everyone in the hall seems to be looking at me. What are they saying? If it's nice, I'm glad. If it's nasty, well, perhaps it's jealousy. Anyway, what do I care? exploring the women history has pushed into the margins. These podcasts are recorded live and all the sounds you hear are made by us live. We are Nikki Fisher, Philippa Rosalind Jackson, Becky Curley, Christina Perel, James Short and Holly Ann White. So ladies, gentlemen and everyone in between, please put your hands together for the cast of Forgotten Women. Thank you so much for joining us for our very first episode. Where we are looking at... Roberta Cowell. Who flew a Spitfire plane in World War II. Roberta Cowell. Who was a record-breaking race driver. Roberta Cowell. Who was legally the first transgender woman in the UK. Roberta Cowell. Wait, what do you mean she was the first transgender woman? She was the first transgender woman in the UK to legally change her gender in 1951. Well, hang on. Wasn't it basically impossible to change your gender before, like, 2004? Not in 1951. The thing you need to know about Roberta Cowell was that she loved cars. Well, the thing you need to know about Roberta Cowell was that she's impulsive. The thing you actually need to know about Roberta Cowell was that she liked to fit in. No, the thing you need to know about Roberta Cowell was that she liked to stand out. But the thing you need to know about Roberta Cowell is that she did things her own way. If she walks by, the men folk getting gross. She can't help it, the girl can't help it. She winks an eye, the bread slice turns to toast. She can't help it, the girl can't help it. Her story starts. Yeah, her story starts when... Yeah, when she... Well, when does it start? Well, for me, her story starts when she's really young. Her dad gives her brother, her sister, and her a patch in his allotment. Her sister grows flowers, her brother, vegetables, and she, well, she frantically digs. The dirt flies everywhere as she tries to reach the center of the earth. Everyone says it's impossible, but she's determined. You see, for me, it starts when she's at school and she's left-handed, but everyone forces her to write with her right hand. And even though it's the most natural thing in the world for her to reach out and brush her hair or her teeth with her left hand, she trains herself to use her right. Roberta Cowell was born in 1918 that's where it starts, in Croydon. The story starts there because the nurses, the doctors, her parents, they look at this newborn baby who is probably screaming and see a penis and decide in that moment that Roberta is called Robert and that she's a boy. Her father, Ernest Cowell, is a decorated war veteran, consulting surgeon, lecturer in human anatomy and has a knighthood. He's a pretty big deal. And from all accounts, a very lovely man. Her mother, Dorothy Miller, is interested in social work. She plays piano and sings. She 
has a strict and very religious upbringing. She begins to dread Sundays and the day-long boredom they bring. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Before the ending of the day, Creator of the world, we pray. When you died, you there seemed to be two grim alternatives. Either you went to heaven and you spent eternity wearing long white robes and playing a harp, or you were damned to everlasting hellfire, which was very unpleasant indeed. I was considered a soul damned to everlasting torment. Why was I considered a sinner and asking for mercy? Why did I have to be delivered from evil? In all those Sundays, I never did find any answers. It's fair to say Roberta grows up in a religious household and she finds this stifling. It's also fair to say that she grows up in a world where there are some pretty clear gender roles. And women's roles are generally inferior to men's. For example, it's not until Roberta is 10 years old and all women in the UK can legally vote. But we're skipping ahead there. Yeah. So one day, when she was five, she was given a scooter. She took this straight to the top of a fairly steep hill and she launched herself down the incline, making noises that were intended to resemble that of a motorcycle engine. <laughs> On reaching the first bend, her attempts to emulate the speedway rider's techniques <laughs> were unsuccessful. Her unconscious body was picked up by a livid nanny. Oh, stupid boy! Thrust in a pushchair and propelled homewards. En route, they met a friend of the family who made her disdain quite clear. Oh, Robert, five years old and still being pushed around like a little girl? Stop your crying, boy. Roberta goes from an all-boys prep school to an all-boys grammar school. And throughout her school days, the other boys tend to laugh at her. This chubby child with glasses. But she starts to save up her, her lunch money and is using it to buy car parts. She likes sports, but hates the communal baths after rugby. The smells, the sweat, the bodies. She doesn't know where to look. She just knows that she doesn't want anyone to look. As a teenager, Roberta dreams about cars. Driving them. Racing them. Designing them. She thinks about becoming a train driver. She thinks about this for maybe 30 seconds. Before she realises she doesn't want to be stuck travelling along someone else's lines. She wants the freedom that comes from cars and planes. Where she can choose the direction and the destination. Where she can carve out her own path. As soon as she's old enough to drive, she starts competing in races. She loves the crowds. The thrill of the chase. The smell of the petrol. The rush of the adrenaline. She buys herself a sports car. She enrolls in a degree in engineering at University College London. This is where she meets Diane Carpenter. Roberta keeps racing and doing speed trials. Of course, at this time, she's racing and studying as Robert Cowell. Is that relevant? No. Yes. Well, yes, because she wouldn't have been given the same opportunities. Anyway. It was during the practice period for the Donington Grand Prix. Roberta is acting as a mechanic. And she's been testing a Maserati. Driving it at maximum speed. Very Roberta. Yes, very Roberta. She's driving at 140 miles per hour. 140 miles per hour, and she's overtaken on both sides by a couple of Mercedes. They must be doing 170 miles per hour at least. She pulls to the pits using the full power of brakes. The front wheel slews inwards. The car stops dead with a jolt. One of the two independent steering boxes shears the key, leaving one front wheel flapping loose. She has a lucky escape. Roberta lives life at full speed. She loves music, especially the piano. She joins a, she joins a band as a pianist. We're two chaps who find it thrilling to do the killing. We're always willing to give the girls a treat. Just a drink at the Ritz, call it double or grits. Then we find the world is at our feet. Top hats, white spats. Look, they find on us, they're the try on us, get them on us when we come your way. By the time Roberta is 20, she's racing every weekend. 
She owns three sports cars now. And she loves the thrill of the chase. And we don't just mean cars. We mean women. I had known many girls, and I had a lot of fun getting to know them. My interest lay in the search for the rainbow, and not for the pot at the end of it. Once I had met a girl, and got to know her a little, I was off again on the chase. So it's 1939, and Roberta's latest girlfriend... Who was very new. And very beautiful. Very new and very beautiful. And Roberta wants to show off at Brooklyn's race course. So they saunter around the paddock and stand behind the exhaust of a car, which is warming up its engine. It crackles, and they can smell the wonderful aroma of burning castor oil and nitrobenzene. Roberta takes a deep breath in and can't help but smile. She thinks this is the perfume of velocity. She looks at her companion, and she opens her mouth. Oh, do let's move on and get away from this horrible smell. That's it. Roberta breathes out. She doesn't know what to say. She leaves her there and then. And flies off into the distance. She also starts flying planes into the distance, because it's the war. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room of 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that, consequently, this country is at war with Germany. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. <coughs> My sister, Margaret Rose, and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. It's January 1940. Roberta has written to the war office because she wants to train as a fighter pilot. She decides it's the best and most responsible job to have. She is sent to a, uh, she is sent to a barracks in Oldershot to train. Roberta finds herself surrounded by men. All these men who swear loudly and speak with food tumbling out of their mouths. Who laugh and shout and push. And this is a world that she understands. This isn't a million miles away from school life. Mm -hmm. But maybe she starts to think about whether she actually belongs there. Well, we don't know that. She might not have thought that. That thought might not even cross her mind. But maybe it does. Say it does. Say she's lying there in her bunk one night, surrounded by all these men who are probably snoring, cooped up alongside all these men with their stories and their bodies and their bravado. And she allows herself to think, just for one second, that maybe she doesn't belong there. But she can't have that thought, can she? Because what does that even mean? No, exactly. She can't have that thought. So she pushes it away. She always pushes it away. She rolls over. She closes her eyes tight and thinks about racing into the distance, disappearing into a cloud of smoke. Well, what we do actually know is that she's then posted to Cambridgeshire in January 1941. 
She gets married in the May, in Croydon. She'd met her wife, Diana Carpenter, earlier, whilst at university. They were both racing drivers, both studying mechanical engineering. Fun fact, Diana was actually the first woman to graduate from UCL with an engineering degree. <laughs> Where she tries to explain about her more feminine side. Diane thinks she understands. She thinks of herself as having a masculine side. So together, they should get along just fine. They arrange the wedding. Roberta even wears her military uniform. Following Roberta's training, she then joins the RAF as a fighter pilot. She is then posted over in France, where the unofficial squadron motto is nil illegitimus carborundum. Huh? And in English? Please. Don't let the blighters grind you down. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, back in England, Diane is pregnant with their first child. And in 1942, Diane gives birth to Anne. It's impossible to know what she thought when she heard that she had a daughter. Did she celebrate that evening with other pilots? Did she think she would die before she even got the chance to meet her? In 1944, Diane gives birth to their second child, Diana. It's a girl, Robert, another girl. Look how beautiful she is. In amongst a brutal war come these two daughters, these glimmers of hope. Does Roberta see herself reflected in her girls? Or does she just see a father that she can't be? Does Diane look at her Roberta and see her strong and confident husband? Do they know that their relationship is doomed? Before the war ends and we can send Roberta back home, something important happens. On the last tour of her trip, her aircraft is hit. East of the Rhine. Her engine cuts dead. She's too low to use a parachute. This is it. She knows she's going to crash. Even if she survives the impact, there's German troops everywhere. I feel an absolute conviction that this would be the very last thing I should ever know. She jettisons the cockpit hood and manages to pull out of the dive just before she hits the ground. I am captured by the Germans as a prisoner of war on the 18th of November, 1944. Every time she moves to a new place, she tries to escape, but is caught every time. Eventually, she is taken to the main interrogation centre. And she's kept there for six weeks. I was put into a tiny cell containing a plank bed and a very small, thin blanket. I spent three weeks in solitary confinement. It was absolute hell. I'd never sat still before with nothing to do, and the days passed incredibly slowly. I would ponder on deep philosophical questions such as, who am I? Who am I? What am I? Perhaps she already knows, already knows that she's a woman. Or she just thinks that she's not like the other men. But what does she do with this information? What can she do? She's certain she's going to die. The camp was enclosed by the usual mass of barbed wire. High wooden watchtowers were spaced at short intervals around the enclosure, and these were manned by guards with machine guns. About four feet inside the barbed wire mass was a single strand. Anyone going beyond this strand was shot at, and the guards shot to kill. Anyone, all anyone can think about is food. We used to sit around describing meals we had eaten and meals we intended to eat in the future. We, we dreamed of food. We argued about food. And the conditions were unimaginable. Wooden huts were divided into rooms and eight men crammed into each small room. Many of the men shaved their heads to avoid getting lice. One day, someone discovered a German baker had put broken glass into the prisoner's tiny rations of bread. It was revenge for a recent bombing. He refused to say how long he'd been doing it for. At one period, there were no Red Cross parcels at all, and all the cats in camp had vanished, never to return. We ate them. Unfortunately, we had no fuel either, and so they had to be eaten raw. There is very little that you cannot eat if you are hungry enough. Whilst in the camp, she teaches a class in automobile engineering for about 70 to 80 prisoners. Wait, go, go back. She teaches a car mechanics class inside a prisoner of war camp. That's pretty incredible. She's really into cars. I meant about the cats. <laughs> anyway, then she's asked to play a woman in the camp theatre. I refused, without hesitation. Accepting the role and letting my hair grow so that I would make a realistic appearance on stage would have been a public declaration of homosexuality. In May 1945, the camp is liberated by the Russians. They have to wait a week, but then they're flying home to England. Roberta has bath. After bath, after bath. As soon as she returns. Scorching hot. It must be scorching hot. Scalding, burning, scathing, scratching, rubbing, 
Roberta arrives home and immediately darts up the stairs and runs a hot bath. She has a fleeting thought, perhaps boiling the kettle, to sterilise the cream, to wash it all away. Skin flaking, sweat breaking, head pounding, breath sounding, body heaving, will fading. She stops scrubbing, scratching, moving. She casts her eyes over her naked body for the first time in a long time. The edges, the lines, the bumps. She's lost three and a half stone. And she's caught scabies. She looks down and knows that this isn't her body. She hears someone call out from downstairs. Robert! Diane. She hadn't even shut the bathroom door. Robert? She closes her eyes and wipes away her tears. Diane is coming up the stairs. Are, are you upstairs? Roberta takes a deep breath in and plunges herself under the surface of the water. What she's been through is... We can't even start to... So many were dead. So many suffered. So many lives affected. So Roberta tries to throw herself back into the world that she knows. Roberta Racing enters cars. the Shelsley Walsh hill climb in 1946. She then starts a number of business ventures. But the horrors of war stay with her. Roberta falls into a deep depression and seeks professional help. She starts going to therapy. Freud says that man wants most of all to be loved. In no way does he minimise the importance of sexuality. I did not have to be told, as so many people do, when they finally see treatment for depression, that the underlying cause of my unhappiness was sexual. I knew that only too well. Roberta is in her bedroom. She is flinging what seems to be every item in her wardrobe onto the floor behind her. Every item Diane has washed, ironed and folded is now in a crumpled heap. Roberta can't seem to find what she's looking for and <coughs> is oblivious to Diane's entrance. Robert, look at all this chaos. Why aren't you dressed? We're sure to be late now. Your brother will be already expecting us. He can wait. They can all wait. I don't have anything to wear, nothing fit. Darling, let me help. What is it you're looking for? You can't help me. It's all wrong. Robert, you're being absurd. You sound just like a woman. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I simply mean... Uh, are you crying? Go, I don't want you here. What's the matter with you? You know, sometimes it's like I don't even know who you are anymore. Didn't you hear me? Leave. The girls and I will be waiting for the, you in the car. Roberta doesn't have the words to explain herself. She watches Diane leave. Roberta opens her mouth, but no words come out. She can see herself tearing the family apart. But she's powerless to stop it. It's as though she's on a runway and she can't turn back. She has to take off. Diane and Roberta separate in 1948. Several months went by in almost unrelieved misery. I tried everything I could think of to pull myself round. Alcohol was a failure. My troubles were far too deep-rooted to be affected by drink. Drugs acted as depressants. I was unhappy in company and when alone. I decided it was much better to be alone because then at least one did not spread depression and gloom. My only sure escape was through music. The emotions music aroused in me were almost too great to bear, but I loved the piano. Hour after hour I would play, losing myself in a sea of harmony. We leave Roberta at the piano and find ourselves looking at a Mr. Michael Dillon. Yes, now Michael Dillon is... Hmm. How do we describe Michael Dillon? Michael Dillon? Well, he's an ordinary looking gentleman. He has round spectacles, a beard and a pipe. He is an Oxford man and he was on the rowing team. He's training to be a doctor. He has kind eyes. <laughs> kind <laughs> eyes? Yeah, in the pictures he looks like he's got kind eyes. The kind of man you can trust. But we don't know that. What we do know is that he was born Laura Dillon in 1951 and begins taking testosterone in the early 1940s. He's one of the first British transgender men that we're aware of to start taking testosterone. And this is at a time when there isn't very much known about the effects of the drug. His consumption of testosterone is unregulated and experimental. Michael writes a book called Self, a study in ethics and endocrinology. Wow, what a catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is where Roberta and Michael's paths cross. Yes, back to Roberta. She's continued with therapy. And buried memories have been unearthed. 
During this time, she begins to discuss her gender with sexologists. By now, I had accepted the fact that nature had originally intended me to be female, but for the purpose of some grim joke, had supplied me with male organs. Although I was tremendously upset and embarrassed when I realised this, it explains a great deal about my nature and character that had always been a puzzle. She embarks on a long period of consultations, medical tests, and begins taking oestrogen. This can't have been an easy decision for her. She must have agonised over the cost, financially, socially, and personally. I was certainly going to need a fair amount of personal drive to go through with the metamorphosis, and I had to face the fact that as I became more feminised, I might lose initiative and cease treatment. This was a risk, but not the only one. There was the possibility that when it was all over, I might not be socially acceptable as a woman. There was the possibility that I might become an invalid. There was also the possibility that the burden of such a secret might be too great to bear. That is, assuming such a secret could be kept at all. But back to Dylan. Yes. Now, this is where Roberta and Michael's paths cross. Roberta reads his book. The book changes everything for her. After reading a book on ethics, which interested me very much, I wrote to the author. We exchanged several long letters, and he asked me to meet him for lunch. Uh, miss? Sorry, miss. Careful, miss. Excuse me, madam. Mais pardon, madame. Uh, merci, mademoiselle. There's a chorus that chimes in time with the shoes as block collides with pavement. Double take, one more glance. Did you see her? Did you see him? Did you see them? She arrived at the Kenton House on James Street, just off Covent Garden, a fashionable 20 minutes early. The restaurant was pleasant enough. The large windows flooded the room with light, and as she meandered her way through the restaurant, she was surrounded by a buzz, occasionally catching snippets of conversations. <laughs> and that's when she sees that her companion had already arrived, even more fashionably than she. His image seems hazy, and I'm not really with it. He sits down at my table and looks as if he's got something to say. He opens his mouth and no words come out. And now I can't stop staring at Mr. Dylan. Eyeing him up like he's a villain. And I'm fixated on his long beard and young face with mistakes and heartbreaks. And Actually, that's a receding hairline. She suggests they sit in the corner. People talk and eat and talk and eat. Something she's learnt is to avoid people in public spaces. To avoid cruel whispers asking, Miss or Sir? She doesn't want to hear their opinions. She likes, for now anyway, to keep somewhat hidden. They sit and he lights his pipe. His lips are small and crusty at the sides. Faint lines follow the curves of his lips. The pipe seems far too big for his mouth. And she wonders how old he is. She sits contemplating her words. Looking down, she notices that the cutlery is incredibly shiny, and if she concentrates hard enough, she can see her face. In the corner of the room is a fire, and in the flames she can see the faces of many from the past. She's been writing to him for weeks, even months now. Ordering drinks and idle chat allows her to watch him noticing his every gesture, as if examining an actor playing a part. She tries to pick apart his performance. His eyes feel much wiser than his appearance, warm and believing. When she feels all the people around her looking at her with disdain, he seems to be the only one reaching out. In a world full of mirrors, he seems to be a window. And now I can't stop staring at Mr. Dylan. I am up like he's a villain. And I'm fixated on his long beard and young face with mistakes and heartbreaks. And maybe he could be of some use. Dylan, by all accounts, is smitten with Roberta following the lunch. He writes her countless letters confessing his growing love for her. They begin courting. Michael takes Roberta to his childhood home to meet the aunt who raised him. He even plans to propose. But there's a problem with all of this. The world, who sees Michael Dillon, still very much sees Roberta as Robert. Carol. So, 
Michael knows that in order to marry Roberta, she will need to legally change her sex. Yes, now this is where the mayhem law is important. This was a common law that was defined as an act of disabling or disfiguring an otherwise healthy male. Castration was illegal under this law in the UK. So Roberta, who desperately wants surgery, is stuck. There's no surgeon out there who's going to agree to operate on her. It's too risky. They could lose their jobs if they were caught. Oh, now if only Roberta knew a, I don't know, a, a student who was willing to do anything for her. Well, then Mr. Then, Dillon. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but Michael isn't qualified. And yet... I, R.C., have, of my own free will, asked and persuaded LMD, who I am aware is an unqualified man, a fifth-year medical student, to perform an orchidectomy upon me. I am also aware that his operating experience has been confined solely to assisting at operations, that he has neither seen nor practiced this particular operation. I desire that he be absolved from all responsibility in this operation. Dylan performs the operation and it's a success. He successfully removes Roberta's testicles. She then books an appointment with a Dr. George Dusso. Dylan is studying for his final medical exams but he's dreaming of his future with Roberta. He buys a ring and sends it to her with a note, telling her not to open it until he passes his exams. In March 1951, he's so certain of his future with Roberta, he tells telling those closest to him that they're already engaged. <coughs> Just to clarify, this is before he's even asked Roberta. So, she then goes to her appointment in, w in Wimple Street, hoping that Dr. Dusso will agree to write her a note saying that she's intersex. If he does this, she can legally change her gender. Her future depends on this moment. He agrees, and he writes the note. In May 1951, Roberta is operated on by renowned plastic surgeon Harold Gillies. Harold Gillies had never conducted this specific operation before. He rehearsed the night before using a cadaver. Nevertheless, the operation is a success. It's a groundbreaking, pioneering operation. And so? On May 17th, 1951, Roberta legally becomes female. She gets her birth certificate amended. Boy becomes girl. Perhaps that night Michael Dillon calls at her flat to see if he can take her out to dinner to celebrate. And perhaps she's not there. Perhaps she's already out celebrating with someone else. And in July 1951, he learns that he's passed his exams. Go ahead, Bobby. Open the package I sent you. Look inside. I passed my exams and we can marry. But she doesn't want to settle down and marry Michael, so she turns him down. Well, she's got what she wants from him. Maybe she did actually like him. She definitely uses him. Not definitely. She strings him along until she gets what she wants and then cuts him out. Tame what you do, it's the way that you do it. Tame what you do, it's the way that you do it. Tame what you do, it's the time that you do it. That's what gets results. Mm -hmm. Roberta launches herself into her new life as a woman. Her new life as Betty. She even starts her own fashion company. This is one of many businesses that Roberta starts but slips through her fingers. She then moves in with her best friend, a Miss Morell. Or Issa. One friend in particular now became very important to me, and she still is. I had met Lisa during my period of abject misery, and we'd be both been staying at the same hotel, and we became first firm friends on our very first meeting. There was a strong, though rather strange, affinity between us. We spent every moment in each other's company. I told her everything there was to be told about myself. Lisa had been there to hold Roberta's hands through the struggle of treatment. She had ordered bunches of flowers to Roberta's hospital room. She had gone with her to hospital the day before the operation. And she sat by her side and she watched her transform into Betty. Betty and Lisa immerse themselves in a more liberal and bohemian life. There were many effeminate men and mannish women among the artistic people Lisa and I now saw. I rather liked most of the women. These people were different, but not as different as they were rumoured to be. Several of us were sitting in the bar when a heavily moustached figure entered with a friend. He scrutinised the face of the company, then turned and said, Where are all the queer people we've come to see? Lisa is by Roberta's side through it all. Through the cruel looks and the whispers, through the diets and the hormone changes. But do we think Lisa and Roberta were together? 
As in a couple? Yeah. Definitely. They lived together for 30 years before Lisa eventually died. They had 30 cats together. <laughs> Roberta dedicates her book to Lisa. They were just friends. They were very good friends. The best of friends. Never know how much I love you Never know how much I care when you put your arms around me, I get a fever that is so hard to bear. You give me fever. When you kiss me, fever. When you hold me tight, fever. In the morning, fever all through the night. I want to be clear. There's not enough evidence to say that. Let's stick to the facts. Her divorce is then finalised in 1952. By 1953, Roberta is back on the track. She's tearing around Silverstone Racetrack. Roberta, or Betty for whatever reason, distances herself from her past life. This includes disowning her two daughters. In some reports, she says she couldn't possibly have fathered children. But there doesn't seem to be a doubt in anyone's minds that they are Roberta's. Roberta walks out on her two daughters when they're aged six and four. This is when her and Diane separate. The girls don't ever get a chance to see Roberta again. We're not here to judge. But you must admit it's hard not to empathise with these two young girls when Roberta abandons them, for whatever her reasons are. We should also draw attention to Roberta's financial difficulties. Yeah, Roberta had never been very good at managing money. And her numerous businesses did not flourish. She was regularly taking expensive hormones. She lived a lavish lifestyle of fast cars, classy Russians and European holidays. And it was only a matter of time before all this caught up with her. In 1954, her business ventures break down and she is in need of money. Later that year, Roberta signs a deal with the Picture Post. Think the Now or the Heat magazine of the 50s. Now this deal is for £8,000. This would be around £200,000 today. This is a really important document because it's one of the first published accounts from an openly transgender author. Uh, an another notable account is Lily Elves. She's better known as the Danish girl. We should say Roberta isn't the most reliable narrator. Mm. She often contradicts herself. Which makes it difficult to get the truth. It's very likely that her main motivation for the book was Probably financial. But some of her accounts just really don't add up with other sources. We should also say, and this is uncomfortable. But unfortunately, in her writing, Roberta seems homophobic and transphobic. Yeah, some of her writing is really quite hard to read. And it's certainly maybe one of the reasons she isn't being held up as the transgender icon today. It's important to remember that she is from another time and possibly her views came from struggling to identify with those labels. So, she gives her story to the Picture Post. She hits the headlines and she's the talk of the town. And later on, she'll win the Chelsea Walsh Hill Climb yet again. Driving is what I do best. Jet planes don't have personality the way racing cars do. Later, she'll be declared bankrupt. Later, she will be interviewed at 53. Nothing falls off my mantelpiece and hits the deck if I'm anywhere near it. I have lapped Silverstone in half a second. Later, her daughter Diana will write her two letters and she'll receive no reply. Later, Lisa will die. Later, she will be 60 and up a ladder with a chainsaw battling hedges. Darling, I may be haughty, I may be cultural, but haughty cultural I am not. Later, she'll meet up with her brother John for lunch and he'll die later that year. Later, she'll die at age 93 in her flat, alone. But for now, we want to leave her where we started, on the steps of a party, about to launch her new life as Betty. Everyone in the hall seems to be looking at me. What are they saying? If it's nice, I'm glad. If it's nasty, well, perhaps it's jealousy. Anyway, what do I care? And now I'm dancing and all the blood in my body has turned to music. The 
past is forgotten. The future doesn't matter. And the glowingly happy present is even better than I had hoped. I am myself. We still have a lot of questions for Roberta. And I guess we're never going to know what the answer is. We're never going to quite know the truth. So, I guess your guess is as good as ours. So, that was our episode on Roberta Cowell. From the pieces of the puzzle that we have found. We hope you enjoyed it. But most of all, we hope that Roberta would have liked it. Darling, who's that one? Where did she come from? She's not from around here, no. Dressed to the nines, but between the lines, has she got something to show? Bouncy blonde hair, complexion so fair, she's seemingly so put together. But trim down the edges, slip off those and she's lonely at the end of her tether Driveway overflowing style with me because on a daily basis in our urban oasis she sees a stop a turn a glance a gape a look a linger a gaze a maze of eyeballs and faces an urban oasis a troubled woman from all manner of places driveway overflowing With the past long behind her, a lifetime soon to be a blur. Her only company, a quiet purr. Where does that leave Roberta? Listening to Nikki Fisher, Philippa Hendry, Rosalind Jackson, Becky Curley, Christina Perel, James Short, and Holly Ann White. The episode was written, directed, and produced by Rebecca Alloway, with additional material from all of us. Original song is composed by Becky Curley. The sound engineer is Mike Taylor. With special thanks to Diana Cowell, Stuart Cowell, Egger Museum, Ed Simpson, and Rosie Haller. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.